Hi all, I'm Zhao Huang. Welcome to the Learning for Interaction session. This session is brought by Fan Boxiang, Yu Zheqing, Fang Chengliu, and me. We will talk about something slightly different from the three division, which is the learning for the interaction. Great. People have already seen many applications of deep learning in the computer vision and natural language processing. For example, the object recognition and the, the machine translation. However, in those tasks, the intelligent agents play passive roles. They wait for the inputs and answer it by the neural networks. Different from those tasks, many other problems, such as the autonomous driving and the robotics, also require the agent to interact with the environment, make a sequence of decisions while watching for the change of the environment. This raises the question, how can we apply learning algorithm for the interaction tasks? To answer this, we think that we need to consider the three components of the interaction tasks, the perception, the environment modeling, and the planning. First, let's consider example. Imagine that we have a robot that wants to open the door. How can we control the robot to achieve this? This task involves the interaction between the robot and the environment, and it requires a complex reasoning process to solve it. Let's see. First, the robot needs to use the eye to see the world. The camera on its head should capture a photo of the current environment so that the robot can analyze and understand the current situation. Is the door open? Is the door far away? Where is the handle? The robot needs to figure out the answer to those questions by observing the door. After observing the current situation, the robot should infer the dynamics of the environment based on its knowledge. For example, the robot should know what will happen if he pulls the door or what will happen if he pushes the door. Knowing this, finally, the robot can select the actions based upon those knowledge to achieve the specific goal. For example, it can push the door to close it or pull the door to open it and execute in the environment to receive the reward. So in short, to interact with the environment, we need to first observe the current states and then infer the consequence of the current actions and choose the actions that can solve the problem. Those three components are necessary for the interaction tasks. We call them perception, the modeling, and the planning, respectively. First, what's the perception? Perception is the most well-studied field in deep learning. We usually solve perception problems with the computer vision techniques. With the powerful neural networks, the machine nowadays can easily classify and detect objects in the scene, do the instant segmentation, and even reconstruct the 3D model from the images. Perception percep provides the materials to build the environment model, gives the agents the knowledge required to understand the state of the environment. As for the model, it usually represents the structured knowledge about the carbon environment. Knowledge may come from the observation, but it can and can also be learned from the experience. Models have various forms. It can be either a physical law or the geometric description of the environment. It can even be the model about your your guess or the other agent's behavior of the other agent's behavior, which is called the theory of the mind. The model is important because it, it describes the objectives or the problems for the later planning algorithm. The last part is to use the planning algorithm to solve the problem described by the model, which assumes that the model represents the environment well. Usually, the agent needs to solve an optimization problem to maximize the expected reward. You can usually you can choose any algorithm to do this. It can be either a classical graph algorithm like the shortest path or a continuous optimization method like the gradient descent. Sometimes we will even use the evolutionary algorithm for planning. The important message here is that the algorithm we choose depends on how the agent models the environment. So 
perception, modeling, and planning, the three form the solution for the interaction tasks. We want to emphasize that the model is a bridge between the perception and the planning. The goal of the perception is to produce the model so that we can use the model to do the planning. Without a suitable environment model, planning becomes impossible. Our goal is to use the machine learning to improve the, to solve the interaction tasks. Learning for interaction means that we hope the agent can acquire knowledge about the environment through interaction and learning. We hope that the machine learning techniques can help the agent to generalize to the novel environment, which is necessary in the open world, in the open environment. The learning is not limited in the perception part, like the conversation. We also need the learning techniques to improve the modeling and the planning part. No matter what part it is, we believe that the key of a successful learning algorithm is to characterize the environment structure. It's easy to see that the model based on the geometry and the physics can easily be better than a set of mysterious linear transform that is a multi-layer perception in terms of generalization. So our question is, how can we incorporate the structured priors into the learning algorithm for the interaction tasks? Here, we are going to present several works of our lab on this direction. Those tasks include both the robotics and the reinforcement learning applications. Let's welcome Van Boer for the, to first introduce the CPN environment. So, uh, you can see my slides, right? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Van Boer Xiang, and uh, I will be presenting our work, the CPN environment which is a robotic learning platform for both doing robotic tasks and uh, learning from those uh, environments. Um, so let's first get started to see an overview of this simulation environment, CPN. So uh, Zhi has just introduced the interaction problems in robotics we need to solve the perception problem and the planning problem. So the perception problem um, includes 2D, 3D vision, or the processing of all kinds of sensor data input. So perception basically helps us make sense of the world. And then we need to do certain planning. Uh, we need to uh, plan in order to control the robot and to manipulate objects inside of this world. Um, so, as we have seen in uh, previous vision works, that we can train the vision models with real-world data. And such a data-driven approach uh, turns out to be very useful for uh, vision problems. Uh, so on the planning side, can we also use a similar approach to collect real-world data of the robot interacting with the world? So that will um, come with several problems. The first is uh, training time, because real-world physics just runs this fast, and we cannot speed it up. So our learning algorithm can also collect data at this pace. Um, so why not use more robots to collect data? Uh, so that will incur a cost. Uh, typically, the cost to maintain the hardware is pretty high. And uh, apart from those, in robotics, harvestability is typically another problem. Uh, even when we use the same robot with very similar hardware, it's still very hard to uh, reproduce some experiments when we use a different ro um, when we put our robot to a different scenario, uh, just because some minor changes in the hardware and the environment. And of course, uh, safety is another concern because operating robot, uh, we really need to consider uh, safety. So, how do we solve these problems? One alternative approach is just to use a simulated environment instead of a real-world environment. So that is our motivation of developing a simulated environment for robotics learning. So in order to develop such a useful simulation environment that can help us uh, learn things of the real world, we need to consider several aspects. One is the accurate physical simulation that simulates the real world well. And we need to integrate real-world robust tools into our simulated environment. 
for researchers to do the same thing in the real and the same, that's the same. And uh, the third is the uh, rendering. For a vision algorithm to work, we need to render a photorealistic scene. So vision algorithms can have some transferability. And lastly, we need simulation content to support the previous three. We, we need a, f a physical content, we need a, a robot uh, models, and we need uh, materials and uh, models to render. So our work, Sapien, uh, is a collection of all these aspects. So uh, before I delve into the details of Sapien, I will first show some demos of the environment. So these videos are some human collected uh, demo uh, demonstrations inside our Sapien environment. So the first case is that our robot will open the fridge and take a cup out. And the second environment is about the robot opening the door of a microwave. And the third environment is a long-term task where the robot needs to lift the buckets, put those on the cart, and then move the cart. Uh, so the third video is a pretty long video, and uh, uh, so while you are watching, I will be talking about how uh, these things are fit together. So we can see we need the the robot that can execute our external commands to move around and uh, manipulate objects, and we can see the objects are articulated. So there are relative motions between object parts, so they can be simulated in a physically realistic way. Yeah, and next, I will talk about how we can achieve this. Okay, so this is an overview of our CPN system. We can start looking at it from the CPN assets. We have um, annotated a partner mobility data set and, and uh, together with some robot models and the layout of objects that can support our simulation. And we have a CPN engine, which is really a physical engine that simulates the physics. And we have a renderer that helps rendering the scene. And on top of those, we have a client API which integrates with the typical robotics control um, tools that uh, researchers can easily integrate uh, robot algorithms with our system. So let's first look at the, the physical engine. Our physical engine is NVIDIA PhysiX, which supports rigid body and a rigid body robot simulation, which is really a set of rigid bodies coupled together with joint constraints. And uh, uh, PhysiX also supports physical simulations, so there's poten potential use in auto autonomous driving scenarios. And uh, the picture is just a toy robot that we can build in our, in our environment that's typically used for reinforcement learning. And the next, our robot integration um, uh, comes in the following. So Sabian has a good support for robot operating system, or ROS, which is a standard solution uh, in the robotics research community to do all the uh, robotic control. So our simulated robot will pre pretend to be real robots. So ROS will treat our robot as if it's a real robot. So here's a, a video demo. So this um, video is currently showing the ROS interface. So, so this one is not a sapien. Th so this interface is used to control real robots. And we are manipulating this robot inside of this uh, a ROS interface, and we are executing a motion planning. So this interface is our Sapien, and we have the robot loaded in the uh, environment. So it's responding to the control signals given by ROS, and uh, it's executing the motion planning uh, given by the ROS software as if it's a real robot. So next is the rendering. So the renderer in Sapien combines a rasterizer and a ray tracer. So the rasterizer is coded in OpenGL and it, and it will give the lighting, normal map, depth, and uh, object segmentation uh, 
uh, of the camera. And this rasterizer is uh, pretty fast, and it, it typically runs at 100 to 1000 frames per second. And the other option is doing ray tracer. We coded it with uh, NVIDIA Optics. And uh, this ray tracer is more physically accurate. The result of the ray tracing is shown in the large picture on the right. So, so we can see uh, it looks more realistic, but uh, uh, it's really slow. Uh, you can only run at uh, 1 frame per second or even uh, 10 seconds per frame. And uh, uh, finally, uh, let's look at our Parnet Mobility dataset. So we annotated a dataset with uh, articulated objects from 46 categories containing more than 2,000 models and more than 14,000 movable parts. And uh, here's a, a demo showing these objects moving. So we can see they have a realistic motion annotated, so we can use these objects in our simulated environment uh, to do some realistic uh, physical simulation. Okay, so now uh, let's jump to the conclusion. So the main take-home messages are that CPM provides a physical simulation and a rendering environment for robotics. And uh, CPM hosts a large-scale dataset of articulated objects that's suitable for, for simulation. And uh, currently, we are working on building a benchmark environment for manipulation tasks. And uh, also, we are using it as an education platform to teach robot learning. Um, so here's some uh, more information. So you, uh, you can visit our CPM project website and uh, get access to our content. And uh, this website, really, you can browse all uh, our models and uh, play it uh, play with the um, articulated parts of these objects. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th 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 that's my introduction of the Sapien. Any questions? Uh, thanks for Fanbo for his introduction to the Sapien environment. And Yu Zhe Qing, uh, today I will talk about robot grasping the 3D vision. The first question to ask is that, why do we care about robot grasping? So, as we can see in the figure, grasping can be used in many fields in life, such as logistics, domestic, and military application. Before the 21st century, physicists and mechanical engineers had already developed a series of analytical models for object grasping. These theoretical models are grounded on physical laws and mathematical proof. However, they need complete model of the object, which is often infeasible for general purpose robot. One application of this analytical model is the query with grasping. They build a pre-labeled data set, calculate the grasp pose during using the analytical model, and during the application, they match the query observed object in the database and choose the most similar one. Six degree of freedom pose of the object need to be estimated in order to execute the grasping. So however, this kind of method is only suitable for industries assembly line, but they are not suitable for I cannot hear you, you Inspired. Yeah. Hello? So there are some problems with your voice, I think. Okay. Okay. So we lost the voice after you said uh, it's not suitable for open environment. Open environment? Okay. Yeah, yeah, actually I stopped here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, inspired by the recent success of deep learning, data-driven grasping becomes a mainstream in recent years. Most of this method formulate grasping as an object detection problem. They use 2D bounding box to represent the grasp position. However, this formulation limits the direction of grasp to be top down, which cannot be applicable to many real world applications. For example, when a robot wants to open a door, it first needs to approach the handle of the door horizontally 
then rotate the handle to open the door. However, using this kind of formulation, the robot can only approach the handle vertically, which is not useful for this application. Another major challenge in the data-driven grasping is that grass pose is difficult to label for a human annotator. So we are human beings. We use our five-finger soft human hand to manipulate this object every day. But a human annotator can hardly to image that what will happen using a metal gripper, which uh, have some totally different structure uh, from human. Besides, the solution for grasping a single object can be infinite. It's hard for a human annotator to cover all the possible poses. Thus, the grasping in open and complex environment is still a hard, hard problem. So here introduce our work, S4G, a data-driven grasping algorithm designed for cluttered environment. There are four characteristics of our problem setting. First, it is single wheeled. We can only observe part of the object. Second, we use a commercial sensor, Kinect2. It means that the observation is noisy. So uh, we formulate this problem in 3D rather than 2D bounding box. It's in able no direction limitation as before. And also, this algorithm is designed for complex thing rather than a single object. We want to use it to solve grasping in cluttered environment. In order to do that, we first need to generate the training data automatically since it cannot be annotated by human. The first step, we, we focus on how to generate the object-centric grasp. Uh, in, other, in the other world, in, in this step, we focus on how to grasp a single object. For example, how to grasp uh, a cup by its handle or plate. We propose a gripper model here based on pre previous antipodal analysis. It can extract information from geometric property like curvature and normal field and then estimate how to place the gripper in order to hold the object firmly. The second step is to generate to thin level grasp. In other words, how to grasp an object in a densely cluttered and occluded thing. In this step, we place the object in a physical simulator and do collision checking from the thin level. Another consideration is the robot execution noise. The robot is not a perfect executor. It can never arrive to our target position precisely, maybe uh, somewhere left or somewhere right. So we want to find some grass poses, even if there is a small error, it can still firmly hold the object. Now we have the training data. We want to train a grass proposal network to directly regress grass poses from observation. The input of this network is single wheel point cloud from Kinect 2, and the output is grass poses and zero quality scores. We use PointNet++ as the backbone. This kind of architecture is good at extracting hierarchical features to have detection. For this application, the local features can be used for extract the grasp ball geometry structure, and the global feature can help do better collision detection. Our grasping algorithm does not rely on real semantic label of object. It recognizes the grasp ball shape. For example, we grasp and cut or a cattle with its handle. What matters is this handle-like structure, not the object category. Thus, we do not need any semantic information for this network. And this model is actually a graspable part detection network. Now come to the experiment. So here is the object sites used for real-world experiments. All tested object is not presented in the training data, even if the training data is totally simulation. Before experiment, we stack the object on the table that some object will be occluded by others. So here is our is a demo of the real world experiment. All the box represents a parallel gripper model. The red box is a chosen frame, and all the frame with other color is high score candidate. The algorithm does not specific which object to grasp. It is just choose the most easy one to grasp any object. So this model can be used for exploratory robots. For example, the robot enter into a 
non unknown and interact with the environment to learn more information about that. By this way, you can learn from interaction with the environment. This will help the forward modeling and planning stage afterwards. Our method can outperform other state-of-the-art method with large margin in both accuracy and efficiency. In our experiment, we directly use the model trained in simulation on real-world robots. No fine training is done here. We find that the point cloud representation have relatively low domain gaps than RGB information. So it may be a better choice to use point cloud representation to bridge the same to real gap. Uh, although our method is efficiency in the baseline, the five second for pre-processing is still not satisfactory. For our application, data transfer is actually the bottleneck. For example, the video data is captured by a connective sensor, transferred back to an embedded robot PC, and then to an external personal computer and the GPU. So we are thinking about that maybe in the future, is it possible that the sensor data can be directly sent to a robot with cyclic GPU without further data transfer? Uh, that's all for my presentation. Is there any questions? Okay. I, I will continue to introduce our works on combining the search and the reference learning methods to solve center interaction tasks. It's called the search with reinforcement learning. Let's just consider a very simple scenario, the end navigation problem. The end robot here is put in the U-shaped maze. It wants to reach the goal on the other side. OK, if we have known everything well, such as the dynamics and dynamics, the location of the obstacles, and how to move the end, we can solve this problem with some motion planning algorithm. For example, the rapidly exploring random tree. It's a kind of search algorithm in the Euclidean space and can find a collision-free path from one point to the goal location under some mild assumptions. However, there are two reasons that prevent us from applying the motion planning algorithm on this task directly. First, the end, which is a very simple robot. Also, it's very simple. It's still a robot. So it has to obey the physical laws and has very complex node-level dynamics. For example, the state of the end is is not the XY coordinates of, in the maze, not just the XY coordinates. It also contains the angle of each joint and their corresponding angular velocities. The action is not to move the end in the uh, Cartesian space in, to one, in one direction of the Cartesian space. We have to control the agent in the fourth level, which means that in every time step, you have to decide the torque applied in each joint of the end. Furthermore, to predict the state in the future, we must consider some physical factors like the inertia, the gravity, the collision with the ground, and many, many others. This is very complex and make, make it hard for the neural network to model, and which is very hard for the planning algorithm in the later. Another main issue is that we want the end to learn the solution. So we assume that the end doesn't know the environment as a beginning. We want it to, to build the map by itself. So the environment map is unknown to the motion planning algorithm. So in this case, no planning algorithm will work. So to overcome those two issues, we proposed a high hybrid framework that combines the reinforcement learning and the search methods. For the first problem, the complex node-level dynamics, we use reinforcement learning to solve it. The reinforcement learning is a powerful tool for node-level control tasks. It can eliminate the need to model the dynamics and works well on very high-dimensional environments because of the generalization ability of the neural networks. However, 
we also use the motion planning algorithm or the search method to solve the high-level planning task. For doing so, we construct a map by sampling landmarks from the experience. The figure below shows how the sample landmarks can represent a map of the environment. This makes the search possible. With RL to combine to handle the no-level control task and use the search using the search method to do the hardware planning, our framework can finally solve this task. Uh, let's go into the detail. Reinforced learning is a class of algorithms. Given the environment, it tries to maximize the agent, agent's expected reward received from the environment. Usually, in the deep reinforcement learning, we use the Poisson network to control the agent. The Poisson network takes the observation as the input and outputs the, output the best action. The, in, the training, in the training, there are two phases, the exploration phase and the exploitation phase. In the exploration phase, the agent will use the Poisson network to explore in the environment by executing the policy in the environment. The result of the interaction with the environment is collected as the trajectories and is stored in the you know, replay buffer as the experience. In the exploitation phase, we sample the experience from the replay buffer and use it to update the policy network. We repeat the exploration, exploitation, exploration, exploitation loop. And what, well, after we train the neural network policy, the policy becomes better and better until it can solve the final problem at the end. This is a general framework of the reinforcement learning. Deep reinforcement learning is a very suitable tool to solve those no never control tasks. It can handle the complex or the high dimensional environment because of the generalization ability of the neural network. However, it's also well known that the RL reinforcement learning suffers from the data efficiency problem, especially it's not data efficient for the non horizontal tasks. A typical RL algorithm usually leads to do the optimization based on the sample trajectories for the non horizontal tasks. The trajectories are too known and it they become high dimensional, making the optimization difficult because of the curse of dimensionality. So we introduce a map to, for the efficient search to solve the non horizon task. We want to map the state. So our method is based on the mapping the state space with the landmarks. This can help us to find a map for the motion planning algorithm. What is the state space? We use the state space to represent the set of all possible states of the agent. Uh, the state space is a high dimensional because of the complex known local dynamics. For the end robot, it has 29 dimensions for, to describe the uh, uh, an joint angle and joint velocities and we need an extra eight dimensions to represent the actions of torque on its joints. However, the key motive observation is that although the local dynamics is complex, the global structure is still very simple. As the figures show, no matter how complex the environment is, it just looks like a simple 2D map on the right. And the simple 2D map is enough for us to find a good high-level path like this. In another word, we can approximate or embed the global structure into a no-dimensional manifold. So we can just use some, apply some dimension reduction methods like the variation autoencoder or TSNE to reduce the dimensionality of the state space and find the coordinate of the agent in the no in the no-dimensional manifold. For similarity, here we just represent the this state. As the, grid, the, as the location of the grid dot in the 2D plane. An important property of the no dimensional manifold is that we can use samples to approximate it. Just like for a 3D shape, we can represent it with a point cloud. In the reference learning, how to do that? In the reference learning, we have a buffer that stores the experience. From the experience, we can sample as many states as we want and go their low dimensional embeddings. 
If we draw those invariance in the 2D plane, it results in an approximated shape of the environment. Those dots form a big U shape, which is in fact a, a, a approximation, of, a, a, a approximation of the original state space. We further transform the sample landmarks into a graph by connecting the nearby points. Notice that we can connect two landmarks. The connectivity means that we can control the agent to move from one landmark to another, which in fact, we needed to solve a short horizon planning problem to decide it. We needed to know if we can solve this problem. However, this is a short horizon planning problem, which can be solved by reinforcement learning easily. In, in the most straightforward setting, you can just imagine that we can try to use the Poisson network to control the agent to go from one landmark to another landmark. And we can, if the end successes, we can just add an edge into the graph. So by connecting the nearby landmarks, we can build a graph, which is more, in fact, a, a approximating model of the environment. The latter part becomes simple. We have the map. We can solve the shortest path problem to find a sequence of landmarks, which represents the high level paths next as shown in the figure. We then use a policy network to control the agent to visit each landmarks one by one until it reaches the final goal. This method is simple, but it is still very effective. Here we show the comparison with the previous state of art R method, the hindsight experience replay. Our algorithm surpasses the baseline in terms of both data efficiency and the success rate. So the conclusion is that we think the key for the interaction task is to model the structure of the state space, especially the low dimensional structure. Thus, I believe that we need to incorporate the structure of the 3D world into the decision making and planning process. Last but not least, combining search and RL is the promising direction for the interaction tasks. That's all. Thank you very much. Questions are welcome. Thank you so much, Zhao. Uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, I don't have any questions personally, but uh, from the audience, if there are any questions. So yeah, Julie here, I have a question. Can you go back to the plot, the previous slide? <clears throat> um, when are you this building one? this? Yeah, when are you building the state space, right? Um, yes. Are you essentially trying to, um, you know, reduce the dimension? Yes. Are you using autoencoder or using other approach? Here, for this, for this, for this. Uh, in fact, for this special problem, we just use the goal space. The goal space is in fact the x y coordinates of the end. But uh, if if you use some some other method, like uh, you can use the autoencoder and or use the Laplacian embedding to find the x y coordinates of the agent directly. Yes. So which will be more efficient in your mind? Uh, it's the same, actually. If Suppose that you have collect, collected mm -hmm. some random trajectories of the end, and then you use some uh, you use some uh, autoencoder. No, the mm -hmm. normal autoencoder will not work, but the variational autoencoder or any autoencoder that has uh, has some regularization on the uh, on the priors of the stru uh, graph structures, then it will induce a low dimension embeddings that can actually reflect the coordinates of the agent in the maze. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, can you go back one more slide? Um, I'm assuming the main contribution is more about the mapping, right? And also building a model. Because once yes. you have the model, essentially you just transform the problem, become a model-based RL. Yes, yes. And then uh -huh. the the model-based RL part, that one is more a standard solution. Yes, yes. I see. Yeah, you can, in fact, you can consider this as a hierarchy RL. Yes, we separate the problem into two levels. And for the lower level, we use the reinforcement learning. And for the higher level, we assume that the lower level policy plays as a maybe like a model and we can use the model provided by the neural network policy to do the search to solve the high level tasks. So yeah. This is some motivations behind this. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. And the key is that we actually for many real problems, we should have some search components in that because the pure reinforcement learning algorithm is not efficient. Yeah. Yes. So um, for this is a, a, a problem more in um, uh, like, you know, again, very nice work, but in more in a toy data set, right? Yes. Um, what about, think about a little more generic the robotic scenario. What is your potential next step? Think about applying this uh, general design principle. Uh, in fact, recently we are just trying to work we are working on several, uh, for example, we can use these techniques for the, to solve the motion planning problems in for robotic, robot arms, right? Yeah. Yes, recently we have a project to, to try to use the neural network, given a 3D thing, we are trying to use the uh, neural network to automatically to discover the landmarks of the uh, 3D thing so that it can speed up the traditional motion planning algorithms. Yes, right. this is one of the applications. Another is that, um, we are, this is just uh, the, maybe the ongoing work. We are considering the, we are considering the general trajectory optimization case for the very, for example, when you want to solve some, to optimize the trajectory that involves the collision with the environment, right? In this case, the, uh, if we, because the environment is not very smooth because of the existence of the collisions, we in this uh, we want we can I think we can also add some search method together with the no level optimization method together to solve it just uh, to um, similar to this approach, and uh, this is one I believe it will be one of the promising direction. Okay, so I guess one of the last question here is, uh, once you um, scale up the uh, use case, right, in terms of complexity and, you know, pra practical scenes, uh, yes. when you're trying to apply, you know, the solution you have here in a principle or in a conceptual way, uh, what is the design challenge you wanted to try to scale up your solution to addressing more complex scenario? Uh, is this very scalable or there's a, some design yeah, challenge? The key challenge here, uh, yeah. uh, that's a good question. And I think the key challenge here is to find a good no dimensional representation of the complex environment. For right. the navigation task, such representation is very easy to find. But uh, for the uh, rewarding tasks, for example, the task that involves right. the multi stage. Multi stage, uh, multi stages. Then, there may be such no dimensional structures may be hard to find. And uh, as I mentioned in the last page, I think in this case we should inject more priors into that. For example, we can introduce the priors about the three D world. For example, no matter how complex the environment it is, it's still in the three D world. So it's the environment that. Uh, that is made of the objects, the, the 3D objects, and their motion should obey the physical laws. And by introducing those in priors, I think we should be able to find some suitable representations, no net dimensional structures that can that can help us to generate this approach into more complex things. Can uh, you guys see my slides now? Yes, uh, Fangshan, before you start, uh, just a gentle reminder about the time. Uh, I think we can go five minutes beyond. We can uh, have extra time, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will go like try to go over uh, in a you know, quick speed because time is limited. Sure. Hi, all. My name that. is uh, Function Liu. Today, I will introduce an Eclair paper on state-based imitation learning under a novel setting. So first, I will briefly talk about common setting of imitation learning and then introduce uh, the our setting and the approach and experiments. Yeah, although uh, currently reinforcement learning has achieved great success in uh, many fields such like video game playing, the game of Go, but it requires a large amount of sample complexity and a lot of computational resources. 
And in some specific field like robotics, we cannot let the robot to explore in real environment because it can be very costly or unsafe. So that's why we are going to introduce imitation learning here to facilitate this kind of learning problem. And the goal of imitation learning is to uh, learning from demonstration, uh, which is also called learning from demonstration, so that you can give an expert demonstration, you will try to mimic the expert behavior. Usually the demonstration uh, will contain some states and action of the of the uh, some agent, uh, expert agent. For example, uh, like position velocity or even some observation like image or point cloud and action usually is a force or torque. So here is a video shows that how the human can collect demonstration using some VR device. So uh, during the procedure, the state and action of the robot will be recorded uh, in the demonstration. And so it will facilitate future robot learning. Okay. So uh, that is a very common setting in robot learning to use a uh, demonstration because it will be very expensive in collecting demonstration for a robot. For example, in the above uh, video, we know that we can use some VR device. And uh, because currently it, it's hard to encode some touch feedback, so usually sometimes the demonstration will fail. And if you can, you can also use a joystick to control the robot. But uh, it's very hard to use a joystick to uh, control a high dimensional robot arm, usually in seven degree of freedom. It's very non-intuitive. So collecting demonstration can be really uh, expensive for this field. So suppose that you only have a demonstration uh, from Sawyer, maybe some, someone has released this demonstration, but you only have Kinova robot or other kind of robot, whichever you have. So how can you learn from such kind of demonstration of a total different uh, agent? So that is uh, what we want to systematically study in this paper, which is called cross-morphology imitation. So in this setting, the imitators are not exactly the same as the expert. They may have different action dynamics. For the top figure, there are two ends. The, the, the left end has four uh, equivalently uh, length legs, but the uh, right figure, this is a disabled end with two legs are shortened. If you apply the same force or torque, uh, the left agent may keep balance, but the right one may fall over, not keep balance. So the consequence of action may be different. We call it different action dynamics. And secondly, it will have di different degree of freedom, like show in the uh, bottom figure. So uh, it's commonly to like like a 6 DOF uh, robot arm to imitate a 7 DOF robot arm or universe. So like for this kind of setting, previous method like behavior cloning or inverse reinforcement learning cannot be directly applied because they are trying to memorize the action sequence or matching the state action distribution. So uh, we want to uh, approach this problem from a state-based perspective. So uh, in the previous work like Zhao has already introduced, we try to abstract some case states in replay buffer to build a model of the environment so that when we want to reach a specific goal, we can search for optimal paths on this environment map. So we can rethink this kind of setting in a cross-morphology imitation scenario, like k-states as sub-goals can actually abstract the task structure. For example, in this uh, demonstration, the robot wants to manipulate this coffee machine. So it will first try to grasp the cup and put it in some location and then press some button. Press some button. So no matter which kind of robot you use, you should obey this kind of spe special sub-goal uh, sub sequence to accomplish a uh, complex task. So uh, that is uh, our method want to, uh, into, uh, that, that, that is uh, the motivation of our method to use a state-based imitation learning method. So uh, we first uh, want, to some, want some global constraint or alignment of the states, like the state visitation distribution of the imitator and the demonstration should be roughly the same or aligned. So here we use Wasserton distance as the metric because it can describe the diff difference between two distributions. And we use negative Wasserton distance as a reward so that maximizing the accumulated reward will be equivalently to minimize Wasserton distance of the demonstration and the imitators. So uh, is that enough? Like we only have turn this distance to a reward, uh, which is kind of weak supervision signal. 
So it's still a reinforcement learning problem. So it cannot can still be not efficient. The agents still need to explore uh, in the whole state space, large state space, which is commonly, which is very common in robot learning, right? So uh, can we have more perspective or more constraint? So uh, consider this scenario. We want to uh, drive from San Diego to New York, and we only have demonstration uh, from the flight. Like uh, like someone told you, you can fly it in this kind of road. But currently, you, you only have the car. So what will you do? Actually, you still know the state uh, the state transition order. You will know uh, which is the next state I should go to, next city I should go to, and how to how to go that. You will have some something like Google Map tells you, oh, you should target at the next city, uh, suppose it uh, blah blah which city, and then you should like keep keep straight for uh, whatever feet and turn left or turn right, some kind of stuff. So similarly, we have the same kind of design. Like we have a model to tell you, oh, which next state you should target at. We call it a next state predictive model. It tells you you should like grasp the cup next. And then we use some inverse model, inverse dynamics model to generate the corresponding action based on your current state and next state so that you can execute this action to reach, reach the desired states. Note that uh, in robotic settings, the inverse dynamics model usually is known, but currently we test our method on reinforcement learning benchmarks. So this, in this benchmark, the inverse model, inverse model is trained online, and the state predictive model is trained based on the demonstration. It tells you which, which, which state is next state. And then we call this uh, action action prior, and we try to we initialize this our robot with action prior, and also use a uh, commonly used trust region method to regularize the policy update. So in this slide, um, the policy objective contains two parts: the global part and the local part. The global part is the clipped advantage, like in PPO. It is computed purely based on reward. It really it is related to the water and distance objective. And the local uh, term is a KL constraint to uh, regularize your updated policy to not be far away from the action prior, which is a common way to reduce variance in reinforcement learning, which is also known as trust region. Yeah, uh, here is some experiments of our uh, approach. Like we tried, we use Mojoko as our main benchmark or experiment to test. So we use Ant and Swimmer to give the demonstration, normal and, and, and normal Swimmer to give demonstration, and we try to modify its body density and body geometry to make it disabled, light, or heavy, and try to imitate from the normal demonstration. And we can see that our method actually outperformed a previous method by a large margin. And we also have a not a kind of setting different degree of freedom. Like we have them, the demonstration of a point mass in a maze, which is seven degree of freedom to reach the other side of the maze. And the end, which has 29 degree of freedom, want to imitate the trajectory of the point of the point mass. And we can see that when the inverse dynamics model become more and more accurate, the success rate is going to approach one. And we also have other kinds of uh, environment in traditional imitation learning setting, which is actually comparable with all the state of the art method. And uh, in this cross morphology imitation, our method is currently uh, outperform all the previous methods by a large margin. And we also have some theoretical justification. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can refer to the paper. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Fangxin. Mm. So, uh, are there any questions from the audience?